All week long on Something's Happening Here, we've been looking at modern, historical, and scriptural examples of rival kings and leaders being in power at the same time, and the chaos that always, inevitably follows that. But surely that can't happen today, right? We are much smarter than our ancestors, and more civilized, surely. <laughs> and yet once we understand the heart of God's warning to us, and the ways that even the most wicked of kings have presented themselves to their people for support and approval, we come to realize that maybe God is trying to warn us also in 2023, so by His grace we won't fall into the same traps. Now will we anyway? That's up to you, friends. I pray in the name of Jesus that none of us will, because God warned us about wicked kings, which is the title of today's show. Thanks for spending another week with us on this program, and may God bless you. All right, friends, you made it. Today is Friday. Uh, if you're watching this as we broadcast it, this is our fifth and final segment of the episode called One King Too Many. And we're going to draw um, some conclusions today. And we're also going to see one more example of history kind of being a prophecy of the modern day so let's get right to it because i don't want to i know we've run over a couple times this week i don't want to keep you so let's get right to it today i want to talk to you about a man named ahab and no not out of the book movie dick from the book first kings <laughs> king ahab of the northern nation of israel if you if you are not familiar with this man, then here is a way to become familiar with him. The article for today is from forumtheater.com. I'm not familiar with that outlet, but this article is called Ahab, the most wicked king in the Bible. Now, I'll just tell you right away, because you will have a link to this in whatever, underneath whatever platform you're watching this. This is a really badly written article, in my humble opinion. It doesn't really know what it is. It, it meanders all over the place. So uh, you can read it if you want to, but fair warning, it's tough and not worth it, in my opinion. We're just going to read the first paragraph because that will set up um, the kind of biography of this man and why we're talking about him. Okay, it, it opens by saying wickedness is a relative term. And yes, <laughs> I'm going to skip the next sentence, but... Wickedness is a relative term, and I, I think we'll see why by the time we're done here. Okay, the article continues saying, In the Bible, there are several kings who could be considered wicked, but none more so than Ahab. Ahab was the king of Israel during a time of great turmoil. The nation was divided between those who worshipped the god of Israel and those who worshipped the god Baal, or Baal is probably how they would have pronounced that. Ahab worshipped Baal and encouraged his people to do the same. This led to a lot of conflict and bloodshed. Ahab was also a very corrupt ruler. He was known for his greed and his abuse of power. He taxed his people heavily, and we'll see why in just a moment, and used the money to fund his own lavish lifestyle. Partly true. Not entirely true. He was also known for his cruelty. He had many people executed, including some who were close to him. In the end, Ahab's wickedness led to his downfall. He was defeated in battle and killed by an enemy soldier. So this guy, Ahab, he is the king who is in charge during one of the most powerful Bible stories in the canon, right? In 1 Kings chapter 18, where the prophet Elijah calls fire down from heaven on, the, on Mount Carmel. Ahab was the king during that time. Ahab was married to a woman named Jezebel whose name is so synonymous with idolatry and evil that I'm always shocked anytime I hear it on a person or an animal or, or a thing, anything dubbed Jezebel. <laughs> um, may, maybe makes you question how much the person who named that, that, that thing really loves that thing. <laughs> That's a bad name. All right. So why, why are we talking about Ahab? It's because before I reach the conclusion for the week, I want to tell you what Ahab used all this tax money for. Yes, it was for his own lavish lifestyle as kings all throughout time always have. King Herod in Jesus' day was no different. 
Um, and yes, he stole from the people and used it for himself, of course. But you know what else Ahab did? Hmm. This may come as a surprise. And to illustrate it, I'm going to take us to the to the ancient city of Megiddo, which is in Israel. And I brought some more photos from when I went there in 2018. Um, Megiddo, in case you care, is the real life place, the real life name from which we get the word Armageddon. Because in Hebrew, it's Har Megiddo or the Mount of Megiddo. And that was kind of transliterated into the word Armageddon. So there's something about Megiddo that inspires, uh, inspired John, anyway, the author of Revelation, to think about the apocalypse, the end of time, the great battle between good and evil. But that's not why we're talking about Megiddo today. Megiddo was a, um, it was a pagan nation, pagan city. It was conquered by Israel, I think by David. Uh, maybe by Solomon. I think by David, though. And Solomon, um, he, it was in, in Solomon's reign that uh, Megiddo was kind of built up as an Israelite city, and there was no natural water source inside the boundary of the city of Megiddo. So the people who lived there had to actually travel outside the walls of the city where all the protection was and go out to a well, get their water, and then come back and hope that in the meantime, they weren't killed or robbed or, or marauded by you know, the people outside the city. Well, this is this is a dangerous situation, and it's not good. It's it's not good to be in a city where you're just in order to meet your basic needs, you run the very real risk of death. So wouldn't it be great if there was a way that you could get from your position of safety inside the city successfully to that water source and back again? without actually leaving the safety of the city. How could you do that? Enter Ahab. All right, so let's go visit. Let's go visit Israel in photo here. This first photo that I'm looking at um, is, it's a modern stairway. And, and see, it's got iron railing there. So it's clearly not the ruins of that, that metal railing. But the stairs, I believe were from from antiquity and they lead down to this opening in the hillside we're actually inside the city of megiddo now and they they kind of burrowed a tunnel from this point inside the city all the way to that water source and so this next photo is again metal stairs not not the original stairs but descending down through the rock to the tunnel that will take us underground to that water source. And so uh, if if the producer can successfully do it, you should be watching a video right now um, of me and, and some of my uh, travel mates there walking through this tunnel. This tunnel that, again, wasn't there when Solomon was king. It was built later on for the purpose of gaining access to that water supply which you'll see at the end of the video is when we actually reach the water supply. And it looks like dry bed there, but it wasn't. It actually, even today, has water there. I just don't think it came out very well on the video. So who did this? Would you believe it was Ahab? Because you'll see why I went through this, right? Think about our modern parallel. Ahab came to power on the back of political strife. If you read 1 Kings 16, there was uh, a former king and he slaughtered his political enemies and then the people heard about it. So they elected a rival king and then they kind of, uh, and then oh, what happened? What happened to this guy? Yeah, he was killed. I guess he committed suicide, that, that first king. And then the one that they elected in his place Plus, yet another king now are ruling at the same time, and it kind of split the populace, and then they fought it out, and one of them won. And then that victor reigned for a little while and had a son, and that was Ahab. So Ahab comes to power like on the tail end of decades of just crazy political strife. 
And what do you do when, when you are now ruling over a divided populace like that? You have to do something to bring them together. And what Ahab did to bring the people together was infrastructure. He, he passed an, a bipartisan infrastructure bill. And he uh, and and one of the things that he managed to do was gain the the funding. That's not the right word, but gain the slaves, I guess, the means to blast his way, not even blast, but to burrow his way through this rock underground in this tunnel. This is by no means the only thing that Ahab did, but ancient Israel became what it was because of Ahab's ruler, his kingship there. He was so invested in creating the infrastructure that would keep the nation together. So do I need to say anything more about that? Or do you see why I went through that? <laughs> As we are living in an almost exact parallel to that, using infrastructure to bring the people together after a protracted period of political instability. Welcome to 2023, or possibly welcome to ancient Israel. Who knows? But the conclusion that we draw from this story and from every other story that we have looked at throughout the week is that God knows what he's talking about. God does not waste words. He doesn't say things for no reason. And what I am thinking of directly here is 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the warning that God gives to his people when they demand a king for themselves other than God himself. And so reading from 1 Samuel 8, picking up the story in verse 10, Samuel uh, told all of the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king, right? So the people gathered to the prophet Samuel said, hey, we want a king to be more like the nations around us. And Samuel talks to God about it. And God says, you should give them what they want because they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me, but warn them the following. And then that's what Samuel is about to tell them. Verse 11, he's giving them the warning from God. Samuel said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his own work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. That's what God said. And so before Israel even had its very first king, God showed up and said, you don't actually want this because it's going to be a nightmare. The nightmare you're bringing upon yourself is so much greater than any blessing you are hoping to receive. And it turned out to be that way. Even the good kings did this. David was a good king, a man after God's own heart. And yet he was such a man of warfare. He slaughtered left and right. He, God forbid him from building the temple because he had so much blood on his hands. Solomon was a good king and a wise king, except for a time he, <laughs> he put his faith in his thousand wives more so than his one heavenly husband, so to speak. Right. And so every king, even the good ones, fall into this paradigm somehow. And what we can understand is that there's no such thing as a good king. It's just not. Now we can say, okay, in our modern day, George Washington was a good king. Okay, but he owned slaves. And that was true of a lot of those early presidents. And we say, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a good king. All right, but he was a man of warfare too. I mean, he had a lot of blood on his hands as well. Um, you could say what? I mean, uh, we've been in a pretty constant state of warfare since the, you know, for the entire 21st century. So 
Obama's got blood on his hands. Bush Jr. has got blood on his hands. Trump has blood on his hands, although he didn't start any of those wars. He just continued fighting them. Right? All of them have these negative things. So where should our faith be, friends? Our faith shouldn't be in any of these people. Our faith needs to be in our heavenly husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only good king, the only one. And he will remain good forever and ever and ever. And he will never pass an economy wrecking nonsense under the guise of infrastructure. <laughs> he will never be the most wicked king Israel had ever had under the guise of infrastructure. Like the, He's not going to lie to you. The Lord loves you. And the Lord says lying is a sin. So you can believe whatever he says is true. And I want that to be our takeaway, friends. The world is going to tear itself apart. It's already tearing itself apart and it will continue to do so. But you and I, let's stay loyal to the only one who deserves our loyalty, Jesus Christ. And let's let the world burn down without us because you and I don't belong to this world. We belong to God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we want to live with you in your kingdom forever and ever. And we know the world is hostile to us. So please protect us from every evil thing the world throws at us and seal our minds to never have loyalty anywhere except with you. Lord, give us grace enough to disengage from Donald Trump and disengage from Joe Biden and disengage from any other character who's going to come into that That. Hegelian dialectic, so to speak. Keep us safe, Father, because we know the only safe place is with Jesus. So bless us and forgive our sins. And we look forward to meeting you soon. Amen. Amen. And friends, I look forward to seeing you soon next Monday for another episode. So make sure one more time you are subscribed on Facebook for now. You're on the Steve Hicks page and you're going to like it to become a follower of it. On YouTube, you go to the Talking Donkey International channel and subscribe to it and also hit your notification bell. On Rumble, you'll find our channel there and hit the follow button. On Locals, you'll join that community for free. And for a fee, you'll gain access to the paywalled content that is published there and nowhere else every week. Um, if you dislike social media entirely, you can find us on TalkingDonkeyInternational.org slash podcast for an entire archive of all of our shows, all three seasons. And we will have announcements coming up for where else you can find us soon. So be patient and pray for us. May God bless you. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you back here Monday.